Jack of All Trades, Bible 5. I'm your host, Joseph. If this is your first time here, welcome. If this is if you're returning, welcome back. Uh, this video is a reproduction of a painting that I did back in 2012, a digital computer composite that was the second only digital composite that I had ever made, a digital painting. Uh, at that time, I had uh, actually made my own Cintiq. Uh, if you're familiar with digital art, there are platforms or drawing boards that have digital displays that allow you to draw directly on the computer. Uh, at the time, I had found this image uh, on DeviantArt. I uh, apologize again, I don't know the original, don't remember the original artist's name, but uh, I thought that this was one of the coolest digital art pieces that I had seen and I wanted to attempt, attempt it myself. Uh, I did do a rendition of it in the computer that was decent, uh, but I always felt that it lacked uh, the smoothness and uh, of the, the original. Uh, and that's because I was lacking in skills and uh, just, I guess, basic knowledge of art, or shading, and, and how to achieve the, the effect that I was going for. But anyway, uh, now we fast forward to 2022, and uh, I came across this image again, and thought that it would make a perfect uh, rendition for the airbrush just because of the type of uh, images, the sharp and then out of focus elements, uh, the way that the shading uh, plays off each other. The original artist painted very much like an airbrush artist would. Uh, so I decided to give it a try. Uh, this is partially freehand, partially paper mask, uh, because I did stencil it out first time. I put it on a light board and uh, illuminated it through the paper and traced out uh, the major landmarks that I could see. And afterwards, I did go ahead and cut out the uh, major elements to give me the sharp edges that I want, rather than having to go in and mask off certain areas and then remove the mask and just create a lot more work. I think the paper masks do a sufficient job of uh, blocking off overspray when you don't need it, protecting areas, and it's non-permanent. And if you're using a metallic background like I am, then you can use magnets to your advantage and reposition uh, your stencils uh, when you need them. So if you have to go back over an area, uh, you can just cover over that area again uh, with the same paper mask, uh, the piece that you cut away, and uh, start to... Uh, and protect the area that you've already sprayed over. Uh, so here I just concentrated on the background, uh, mainly using transparent black. These are illustration colors that I'm using. Uh, I did go ahead and use the regular Createx transparent sand, uh, or uh, I guess it was the color. The uh, for like the brickwork and some of the flesh tones actually worked out. Uh, pretty good. The uh, and burnt sienna, burnt umber, uh, some straight transparent orange, uh, red, and cerulean blue. I did switch back to a cobalt blue because I thought the cerulean blue was a little too light uh, and greenish color, so I wanted a more true kind of darker blue uh, on the one vehicle so uh, I did change out the color slightly uh, I used the same color for the windows in the background just sprayed very lightly here you'll notice that I'm spraying the black undercarriage of the cars as much as possible using the same color black and just spraying lightly for the light gray and obviously darker where I want it pure black. Now, with this paint, again, with the process, you will find that sometimes the eraser is not strong enough to pull back the highlight that you're going after. 
so it is sometimes necessary to use the razor. Just be very light. This particular razor that I'm using is a chisel tip. The reason I like it is because I can hold the razor blade more like a pencil and still have the blade almost parallel to the work surface, uh, given the unique angle of the chisel tip. So I don't have to hold it so much on its side when scraping. So I've actually found it to be an advantage using that particular type of tip. Uh, here for the Hulk, the color ears, uh, it was just moss green and sepia. Uh, using the sepia, obviously, for the darkest browns and almost black colors, the moss green, just concentrating it, going back over an area, darking it up as dark as possible before going in with the sepia to make sure that I have the full tonal range of value between them. Now I will go back and forth between the different color ranges, the light green and the sepia, which is a brownish brown with a green hint. So it actually worked together uh, for the effect that I was going for. The airbrushes that I'm using are a Master Airbrush G48 and Master Airbrush G44. Initially, I was trying to paint this entire painting with just one airbrush, but after a while, it's too ha much of a hassle for me to constantly flush out the cup, rinse it out, do a different color, go back, as you will notice, I did quite a large section with the same airbrush, just washing it out and using a different color. But once I started getting into the green and purple and browns, and I just said, forget it. It's too much hassle, and I broke out the G44. Uh, I will say that uh, as of late, uh, I after taking some of Drew Blair's courses and really practicing with my uh, trigger technique that I have been able to get, uh, gain a lot more precision out of all of my airbrushes. So uh, just if you haven't tried it, give it a try, think about it. It's, uh, it's a strange position to hang your finger so far over the front of the airbrush. But honestly, once you press down, you just the slightest flexing of your muscle will cause the airbrush to spit out paint. And if you practice enough with it, you can get micron thin lines out of almost any airbrush uh, with just a little bit of practice. And yes, some modification to the airbrush. Again, like I said before in my other videos, uh, or at least one of my other videos that I do modify my airbrushes. I polish the needle. I uh, seal the nozzle with wax. I will try to lube the uh, any areas of friction that uh, the trick in the trigger area where the pieces of metal actually come into contact. I'll try to add lube there, but I'll try to keep it out of the valve stem area just because again that's been told that they can gunk up your valve stem uh, if you don't use your airbrush on a regular basis i use them every single day so so far there's not been an issue okay so on the body here you'll notice that i broke it up into sections again uh, anywhere i see a natural border from the legs to the waist to the chest, to the head. Uh, I will use those natural borders, use them as landmarks, and I will replace the pieces that I had used or had cut away to block off uh, areas that I've already completed, so to not ruin the artwork that I've already done. Here you will see the face. Uh, I did do the face a little bit low. Uh, you'll notice that there was uh, from where the top of the paint stops uh, in the background to where the top of the head was drawn out on the work surface. 
you can tell that it was slightly off. So when I started to draw in his face, it looked much lower and smaller on the on the design. So I had to go in and erase and really kind of give some more definition to his chin because it kind of disappeared and made his chin look very weak. But right now I've gone in with some opaque white to bring out some of that highlights and that kind of pastel green color that I was seeing in the reference. Uh, I, again, I will use erasers, uh, dowels, razor blades, whatever I have to, to try to bring back white highlights, knock back the value of a color that I have sprayed. Uh, sometimes I will try to do it as lightly as possible. I don't want a, a very uh, distinct or, or obtruse uh, eraser mark. I want it to, to texture out, to kind of crumble away. Like, uh, basically when you would uh, erase on a piece of paper and you would still see that ghost image of whatever it is that you erased, Sometimes that's what I'm going after, is just that ghost image, just the indication of color. And uh, sometimes the best way to do that is to spray an area and then to erase back, leaving just the smallest particles of color of paint uh, on your surface. So here, again, we're going, I go to the Wolverine character. Uh, you'll notice that I try to work in layers, uh, usually background, for middle ground, and then foreground. Uh, sometimes I'll do it reverse. I'll go foreground, midground, then background. But again, I always try to stick to that formula of uh, working the farthest back to the closest or, or closest far to the farthest back. Uh, if you try to I don't know I think that if you jump back and forth and try to uh, do too much at once that sometimes your image can become muddled and not look very defined and you won't see that depth of field uh, so here again just cutting away natural borders the ears I decided to try to extend the uh, tip of his ear beyond the border, the, uh, the taped border that I created around the edge of the paper. There's about a three quarter inch border uh, and about a quarter inch of tape actually securing the paper to the work surface. Uh, again, I just love magnets because you can move them around, you can reposition them. Uh, I'd, Again, use freehand shields when I have to, uh, freehand techniques when I want a softer edge, and uh, just keep, uh, keep your light source in mind always, uh, where your shadows are coming from, where your uh, specular highlights are hitting. Uh, try to think about the shape of how the light is turning away from a subject and rolling over and getting darker as it moves away from the light source. Uh, everything is in three dimensions. You want to always look at things in that way uh, from a center point out, uh, darkest area uh, outward. So you'll notice that I block in the shapes. Then I'll go in and darken up the darkest areas and then blend it out. Um, Again, I work light to dark just because uh, with airbrushing, if you spray a light colored paint over a dark surface, you will get a sh blue shift usually. And uh, you don't get that if you do it the opposite way. If you spray light, then spray in your darks. So it's something that I've noticed lately that I've been trying to do uh, or keep track of is, is the order in which that I uh, spray my paint. Sometimes I want the blue shift, so I will intentionally spray a light color over a dark color, color trying to get that blue shift. Uh, just uh, again, so if I am going for a particular color, a, sh uh, a hue, uh, trying to always think of color theory again, 
if uh, I'm going with a skin tone and I spray a dark area uh, and I spray a light area over the top of it and it's going to blue shift, well then I'm going to have to use an orange to counteract that blue to give it more of a natural dark or brownish neutral color and not the brown color. So uh, here I just spraying in the little tiny hairs and using the razor to, to first of the white hairs. These are kind of thicker animal hairs that Wolverine has on his arms and uh, actually throughout his body he's a pretty hairy guy. So, And uh, finally we're just finishing up with the last little section here, the glove. Again, uh, the way I see it, there are tones of blue and gray and black uh, in the leather portions of the sections of his outfit and uh, I used a cobalt blue with a Payne's gray to achieve that color and here I'm just uh, pulling away the uh, border to reveal the final artwork so you so again this was a fun process I hope you enjoyed it